Hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Shabir Musa, a professor in family medicine. Uh, welcome. Um, we're very glad to have Dr. Bokam Motletlotlo, who's going to talk about the image gap training. Um, and uh, she's a community psychiatrist who works in Johannesburg, a colleague of ours. Um, we really hope that you um, engage with the image gap training, as um, the expectation is that many more. Uh, doctors, journalists, um, family physicians manage mental health care in primary care without needing to resort to a psychiatrist or psychologist. So with that, uh, I want to welcome Dr. Letlotlo. Dr. Letlotlo, you're free to share your screen and uh, your, you can also show your video if you like so that people can see you as you talk. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, thank you for having me this morning. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, can everyone see that? Yes, it's very visible. Thank you. Okay. I uh, just want to see how to remove this something. I'm sorry. I may have opened a window on the side here that shows no, it's nothing else is visible. We just see a screen share. We only see the screen. Okay, I hope it doesn't obstruct my view. Uh, okay, you know, there's a, there's a video with um, there's something with the slide of participants. I could have done that and probably don't know how to undo it. But um, I'll continue. Thank you for having me this morning and thank you for the introduction, Prof Musa. Um, you know, I thought I should maybe just touch a little bit on this. <laughs> I wonder who's really good with technology that could tell me how to remove. There's a black slide on the right of my, there's a black uh, board on the right side of my slide. And I see it, it hinders um, some of the writing on my slide. Would anyone know what that is? Um, oh, okay, I think it's fine. I think. You managed. All right. All right. I thought I should just, you know, um, touch on the fact that, you know, mental, neurological and substance use disorders are major contributors um, to the global health disease. And this is according to the World Health Organization. Um, and they're said to contribute at least 14% um, to the overall global health disease burden. And we're talking morbidity and mortality. And that's quite significant. Um, it's also interesting that these illnesses, you know, that, that are some of the leading um, contributors are also the highest stigmatized disorders. And this is specifically so in low to middle income countries. Um, and we know, you know, with this kind of illnesses, we face, you know, quite significant socioeconomic impact because this renders people to, you know, sometimes not able to attain their highest level of education. And with that comes, um, you know, unemployment and lack of financial dependency, and therefore um, the dependency on um, the very um, already um, trained resources. And so that was um, the whole rationale for um, the development of this um, gap action program, which is really meant to come in and bridge this gap. Um, I know that most of you are already aware of this. Um, so the gap is for use is intended for use in non-specialized healthcare settings, um, and we are talking level one and two healthcare facilities. So primarily at a primary healthcare level. And as Prof has just mentioned, this is aimed at family physicians, general practitioners, being that be nurses or doctors. And you know this um, impresses on already the objectives of the primary health care, which are you know the screening. If we screen early, then there's early detection and there's early intervention, um, which will obviously prevent um, later negative outcomes and therefore early referrals. And with this, um, we talk about continuous monitoring and management of outpatient chronic mental illnesses. So this will be patients that have been down referred from either. Um, you know, our hospitals or um, our clinics um, that are based at the primary healthcare levels. If we look at this triangle, um, I think this triangle talks to the ideal. Um, it talks to strengthening the lower part 
of, of the triangle, strengthening the self-care. And this includes the awareness um, of mental illnesses. If we can raise awareness of mental illnesses, if we can um, normalize the symptoms and therefore normalize seeking care at a much earlier stage, then we would be able to to screen early, you know, detect early, and therefore prevent later negative outcomes, which are much, much costly, as we have seen in the past. And as it currently continues, we see people not seeking care, you know, early enough, and only coming in at the top of that triangle, when they either need a hospital admission, and this usually results in a very long in stay in specialized facilities, obviously, this is, you know, not cost effective, it includes, um, you know, quite high level care of treatment. And we see that when patients are discharged from the top of the triangle to go and follow up at the bottom of this triangle, which may be with, um, you know, non formal medical um, health care services and the primary health care service, we find that, you know, that bottom of the triangle is not as strong as it should be. Hence, we have this. Um, we have this, you know, patients go, they, they get admitted, they stay in hospitals for a long time, they get discharged, they get lost to follow up. Um, there are a lot of stigma. I um, mean, a lot of factors do play into, you know, you know, the lack of strength at the bottom of the triangle. So the whole point of today and the whole point of this integration as we talk about and the whole point of the gap is to strengthen that lower part of the um, of the triangle. And this is, you know, part of it is training, like we are saying, um, the general practitioners to be able to detect, to screen, and to manage um, mild to moderate mental illnesses, and to be able to refer early um, where intervention by specialist is necessary. So that will be much more cost effective. We have a larger, you know, part of the population that are operating at the lower part of this triangle, um, you know, without significant morbidity and hopefully um, avoiding mortality. Um, so in South Africa, you know, our, our one and very interesting study um, thus far has been the stress and health survey, the, the SESH study, which people can go and look up. And it talks to, you know, you know this, is, this is the most interesting study because for the first time it profiled South African population and according to this, and, and I think it was published in 2013, and there have been, you know, follow-ups to this study, but generally I think um, what con is consistently reported is that about two or three out of every 10 people will suffer a mental illness. And we know that about only a quarter of these people will go on and seek um, care for their mental um, symptoms. Anxiety remains the leading disorder um, in South Africa. And there, is, there seems to be quite a high association with anxiety disorders and substance use disorders as well. And we know that people self-medicate quite a lot, but sometimes it's difficult to try and distinguish which came before which. So anxiety, substance use disorders and depressive disorders are currently the leading disorders, I think globally and in South Africa as well. Psychotic dis disorders and you know, other mood disorders such as bipolar are relatively rare. So we're going to talk more today about um, a major depressive disorder. We use what we call the DSM-5 criterion um, in diagnosing a major depressive disorder. I know that at a primary healthcare level, you use the, um, um, the standard treatment guidelines. It, it talks to the same symptoms. It talks to the same approach in the management. So according to the DSM-5 criterion, you need at least five symptoms of mood irritability, um, depressed mood, or anhedonia. Anhedonia means that people have lost interest um, in activities that previously interested them. Um, so there will be a reduction of interest or there would be a total loss of interest um, in what the person used to enjoy before. And according to this criteria, the symptoms generally need to be going on for at least two weeks, a minimum of two weeks. So the person should report feelings of sadness. They, um, they could easily get irritable. Um, they could report feeling teary. Um, they will report um, what we call an impairment in neurovegetative factors. And this will be sleep, you know, whether this is the initiation of the sleep that's impaired, whether it is the maintenance of the sleep, um, or this early awakening, okay, or just generally a very poor quality sleep in that the person has slept, they wake up in the morning and they still feel quite tired. Appetite is also affected and it can be affected as well in either direction. It could be increased or it could be significantly reduced, quite commonly significantly reduced. 
And that, you know, the fluctuations with appetite will also be associated with um, the weight changes. Energy is usually very low um, with people that are depressed. Um, and this is generally in the day. Some people may specifically feel quite low levels of energy at waking up in the morning. Libido becomes quite affected in that there is either no interest um, or there would be sexual you know, um, disorders you know, such as um, premature ejaculation, weak erections and so on. Um, I think most importantly, and, and probably one of the big reasons why um, this is such an impairing disorder is the concentration in the memory, which we call neurocognitive factors. Um, if people are not able to attend and concentrate to, to their surroundings and most importantly to their jobs or academics, um, that will affect how they're functioning. And obviously if you cannot attend to, um, if you cannot attend to um, what you need to be attending to, you will not be able to form a memory of it. So there'll be memory impairments. Um, most importantly, um, depression is associated with this feelings of hopelessness, guilt, worthlessness, and that you know the person feels they're not worthy of much. Um, they get self-image problems, um, quite negative um, self-image uh, perception. <clears throat> they get quite preoccupied with death. And I think that it's quite important to say it like that because not everyone would come in and say they want to kill themselves. But you find that people with the general loss of interest in, in leaving um, and loss of enjoyment in, in any activities, they, they start you know, fantasizing and wishing that they did not exist. So they may wish that um, they, they, they disappeared or someone kills them. <clears throat> um, and sometimes then people will, will tell you of their intent to or, or the desire to die. They generally lack motivation um, to do anything. Um, you know, we spoke about how they feel quite hopeless. The energy is low. Um, they don't enjoy anything. So you find that you know anything that they need to do becomes quite a job. They need to put quite a lot of energy. So there's lack of motivation, um, and therefore sometimes they don't they don't put in um, the effort to do anything. So and this I think is why it is you know major depressive disorder is such an isolating illness. If you lack motivation, if you're not enjoying anything, if everything starts feeling like quite a task to anyone, you know generally people feel easier um, and less energy consuming to just be by yourself um, and isolate. With any illness, um, whether it is anxiety or whether it is depression, um, people are allowed to feel any, you know, a range of emotions. Um, people are allowed to feel some anxiety, which may be good, um, you know, to attain um, good things in life. The problem with, you know, and, and when we start talking about disorders and uh, mental illnesses is when functioning is impacted. Um, and when we talk about functioning, we look at how people are functioning um, in their social areas. So socially, how people are getting along with other people, with neighbors, with family members, with people at work. Um, you know, we look at occupational functioning, you know, is, is the person still able to um, produce, you know, what is expected of their jobs um, at, at a level that is expected? Are people still able to perform academically as they should? So that is when we talk about a drop in the level of functioning or people continue um, with quite significant levels of distress, okay? With the diagnosis of a major depressive disorder, um, it is important to ensure that there has not been a previous history of mania and hypomanic episodes. We will touch on the criteria for this too later. It is very important to ensure that you have, you know, you're not dealing with another medical disorder that could possibly explain some of the symptoms. Um, um, and I think what is very important and what is very important as well in the, um, in the African community is sometimes how the, the symptoms of depression is interpreted. Not everyone may come and talk about, you know, the sad and the irritable symptoms, you know, the criterion as we have gone through it. People may just come to you and I think quite commonly so with somatic symptoms. So complaining of aches, body aches, whether it's the shoulders, the abdomen, the, and it is important, you know, to, to explore those symptoms and sometimes to ask more direct questions. Okay, so that's the criterion. I put in the, the this what we call the specifiers because 
just for the significance that they carry. So once we have diagnosed people with a major depressive disorders, it is important to try and see what else is associated with their depression. Um, so, you know, commonly, you know, th this will be the things that will be associated, what we call the specifiers, that people may present to you um, having left the depression ongoing for some time with some anxiety. You find that the person is very depressed, uh, but they also have this, you know, quite constant worry. Could be worry about anything, um, about theirs or their loved one's safety, um, worry about generally performing well. Um, you know, they present with tension and restlessness. It is important to know that in these people, th this is usually where the suicide rates are, are quite high. Um, and I will explain why, especially after you have started them on an SSRI or an antidepressant. And um, these are the people that need to be looked at um, much closer. And then we, ha we have sometimes a presentation of what we call a peripartum onset. Peripartum can start um, anytime in the third trimester um, and continues post the delivery um, of um, the baby. Continues for about four weeks, some literature would say six weeks. The significance here is that if, if someone, you know, had depression during this time, you know, then the episodes of depression is likely to recur. And sometimes in the long term, they may even present with mania. So again, those are people that you, you, know, you, you sort of want to keep in close um, contact. You, you, know, you want to monitor them closely, um, even though they, they would have gone um, into remission after you have treated them for their first episode of depression. And then we have people that present with what we call atypical features of depression. They are atypical because they're not typical of depression. So they present with mood reactivity. You know, um, we spoke about the mood that they present with. They're sad, they're irritable, or they're teary. Here you find that they may respond a lot to what's happening in the environment. If there are positive factors in the environment, they may feel okay. If there are negative factors in the environment, that may take away from their mood. What goes with this is um, um, quite significant weight increases increases in appetite. And you find that unlike um, with, with just, you know, the criterion that we spoke about with regards to the sleep, um, they oversleep, they sleep in the day, they sleep in the night, which is what we call hypersomnia. And they explain what we call lead in paralysis and that they feel heaviness in their limbs. The significance of this presentation is these people are most likely to switch to mania or hypomania once you start them on antidepressants. So those will be people that will require um, a much earlier follow-up. Um, you need to pick up the symptoms of you know, hypomania and mania quite quickly so you could give them a mood stabilizer if they do switch. Okay. And then we've got a presentation as well with depression that may be psychotic. And I'm mentioning this because sometimes depression tends to look quite similar to schizophrenia. With the psychotic symptoms that present in depression, you will find that whatever the person is, is reporting um, um, as, as their delusions um, or their hallucinations, those would be in keeping with their mood, okay? Versus in, in, in schizophrenia where people may report quite distressing psychotic symptoms without showing um, a mood reactivity, without a mood being appropriate to what they are talking about. I hope that makes sense. Um, a depression with psychotic features has quite poor outcomes. Okay. And then we have um, catatonic features as a specifier. Catatonia, I mean, includes quite a range of um, symptoms um, from psychomotor slowing that people are just slowed in, in, in their movements, slowed maybe even in their responses to you, slowed maybe even in their comprehension um, of, of, you know, um, your conversation with them. They may present with complete mutism in that they do not speak, or they may be quite selective in when uh, and who they speak to. They may posture, so they assume quite um, uncomfortable postures um, and it looks quite inappropriate, um, but they're quite, they don't, they're not attentive to the, to the environment, so they don't know this, okay. I think catatonia is, 
you know, is, is a medical symptom until proven otherwise. Um, it can be associated with quite severe um, depression and, you know, uh, we treat that with um, um, ECT. And then we have lastly rapid cycling. I mean, rapid cycling are people that will that present um, quite frequently in the year. And this is, these people usually necessitate a hospital admission. Their symptoms usually necessitate a hospital admissions. And you'll find that people, rapid cyclists need to be admitted at least four times in a year. Um, and this bears the significance in that it, you know, the issues usually have to do with adherence, um, you know, with substance use, and most importantly, we could be dealing with bipolar. Okay, so those are just the specifiers to keep in mind. Okay, um, I believe that everyone is already following this uh, standard treatment guidelines and um, essential medicines list for South Africa. I took the 2019 revised um, one um, and in chapter 15 covers everything about mental illness. So the general measures as, as um, stipulated in the, is in, in an approach to treat anyone with um, any mental illness anyway, is to have an empathic attitude. Um, and please do discuss uncertainty with a specialist at any point in time. Um, assess the severity of the condition and the suicide risk. Okay. Um, it is always important, like we said, to exclude and optimize treatment of underlying or comorbid medical conditions. Hypothyroidism um, specifically um, in relation to the depression is that it can present with, you know, what we call um, maybe uh, mood incontinence or labile mood. So it may impress as depression and people may have, um, the, you know, the anxiety or the anxiousness um, that we spoke about. So it's important to do a thyroid function. It's important to, to check for anemia, um, HIV, um, and all the other medical illnesses, okay. Of course, people can have um, depressive disorder or anxiety disorder from an underlying medical condition. What we should always do is to, to treat um, the medical condition. Um, and once it is in remission, then we can reliably assess um, what, is, um, what are the, the psychiatric symptoms that remain as a result of the medical condition, okay. So I thought we should rather approach it as, you know, like this, um, talk about an approach to the management of this. Um, we have mild depressive disorders. We have what we call moderate to severe depressive disorders. So people with mild, moderate, uh, mild depressive disorders are people that you think um, may do well with psychotherapy. You know, people that do not have severe enough symptoms to warrant treatment. Um, um, and you're more than welcome to, you know, give them a trial of psychotherapy, um, the first few sessions. Um, psychotherapy may also include self-help options, um, and those include, you know, non-governmental organization. I think the South African Depression and Anxiety Group has been phenomenal in supporting people. Um, so you've got the SADAC, you've got other um, NGOs. Only when psychotherapy does not work for what you would um, would have assessed as mild depressive disorders, would we then want to augment that with pharmacotherapy? It is always important, I think, um, and I think, you know, the, the psychoeducation with regards to the diet, the exercise, um, sleep, um, we don't value it as much as we should, I think. Um, and um, these are just, you know, small conservative measures that could avoid um, you know, pharmaco pharmacotherapy in a patient. Okay, so um, I mean, when you talk exercise, we talk about um, a cardiovascular exercise, at least three hours, at least three um, exercise sessions in a week of at least 20 minutes each um, where there's cardiovascular activity. So, so that would mean that, you know, someone is exercising um, at a, or walking, you know, running any kind of um, a cardio workout where <laughs> carrying, you know, um, conversations may be difficult. It should be difficult when you're exercising to carry a, a normal conversations and, and speak in sentences. So the heart should be beating fast enough and you should be, you know, out of breath 
you know, to a point that you, you can't speak in sentences. Um, um, and sleep, you know, encouraging good sleep hygiene, which we'll talk about later on, and really psychoeducating people on substance misuse. You know, people tend to use um, alcohol, other substances, over the counter medications to help them sleep at night. And most importantly, um, mobilization of their support structures, okay, getting family members to assist them, getting them to join groups, even, you know, there are a lot of groups that have been developed in the in the communities um, that people we treat come from. Um, and this may even be religious groups. So you may find that with just those conservative measures um, and self-help options or psychotherapy, um, we are able to treat a mild depressive disorder. Okay, where well, you feel that symptoms are severe enough, um, um, then the first line will be um, pharmacotherapy. Um, and you may augment it with psychotherapy or the self-help um, options. Treatment duration um, after a first episode of a depressive disorder is anything between six to 12 months. We tend to make it slightly longer if people had anxiety symptoms. And after two episodes, then um, treatment duration increases. When we get to the end of the treatment duration of the maintenance period for the depressive episode, we taper down treatment. So it's a weaning off strategy. Um, and following people up maybe a month to three months thereafter to ensure that they are still doing okay without medication. Um, again, um, I took this from the, the, the STGs and EML um, that we use at the, at the primary health care. And I think it talks nicely to, to the options that we have um, with regards to the antidepressants that we have. So we know that the treatment for antidepressants is um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And at a primary healthcare level, we only have citalopram and fluoxetine. Um, some PHCs may also have what we call cetrine, um, but it's not readily available everywhere. So citalopram and fluoxetine. And we have what we call a serotonin and noadrenaline reuptake inhibitor. We have venlafaxine in our EML. Um, the XR is the long acting. Um, so this means that we give it once a day. Um, and then we have um, the tricyclic antidepressants, um, which is amitriptyline or nortriptyline. I think we have amitriptyline quite readily available at the PHC level. So with the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs, um, we talk about citalopram and fluoxetine. The initiation dose at citalopram starts at 10 milligrams um, in the morning. So citalopram, SSRIs are activating. That is why we want, or we would prefer them to be taken in the morning versus in the evening. There are some odd patients that would report some sedation um, on SSRIs and sometimes we give it in the, in the evening, but th that is quite rare. So citalopram initiating dose is 10 milligrams in the morning, 10 milligrams is a very low dose. Um, the doses range from 10 to 60 milligrams. So um, a minimal therapeutic dose is at least 20 milligrams. So we initiate citalopram at the 10 milligrams for at least a week, and then we increase it to 20 milligrams, and then we wait. So the thing with antidepressants, unfortunately, unlike you know um, um, antibiotics or um, other medications is that it takes some time um, to penetrate the brain. It takes some time to reach a therapeutic level in the brain. So it requires some patience. Um, so it takes at least a week to two um, to start working um, and at least two weeks to six weeks to peak. So at 20 milligrams, we would leave it for a minimum of six weeks um, before we assess response, okay? Um, so, it, you know, we expect some partial response from two weeks onwards, okay? Um, if partial response, um, you may increase to 30 milligrams, please. I think increase at 10 milligram increments um, because it, it does have its own side effects. I mean, SSRIs have their own side effects. And I think the most significant um, is that on the heart um, that it can cause its own arrhythmias. Um, and hence, you know, in, in um, the elderly, we would avoid much higher 
um, concentrations. So I wouldn't go maybe above 30 or 40 milligrams in someone that's elderly, unless if you're going to closely monitor them. Augmentation with psychotherapy is, is quite a strategy to, you know, so literature has shown us that if, if we augment and if we augment early on with psychotherapy, um, this seems to reduce the need to increase um, the doses. This seems to um, reduce the need to get to the maximum doses of the medications. So I would really encourage you to, to do that much earlier on. If there's no response, um, please do consult with any of the um, psychiatrists. Um, we would need to reevaluate the diagnosis, you know, repeat general measures, adherence, um, and you always need to screen for substance use, okay? And I think just like with any other condition that you may treat, if someone comes in there, you know, the hypertension is uncontrolled, first you, you check that, the, you, you know, they're adherent to the treatment, they're not using other medications, they're not using substances, and we psychoeducate around that. We may want to mobilize some family support to promote adherence to the medication um, before we say the treatment has failed, okay? Um, if you're not satisfied with the response to citalopram, um, then we have fluoxetine. I would prefer that you start with citalopram first because it has a relatively um, lower half-life than fluoxetine. So half-life of citalopram is about 16 to 24 hours. Fluoxetine carries at least a seven day half-life. Um, so we find that some, if you had started treatment with fluoxetine and, and it's not, um, you know, you didn't get an adequate response and you need to change to another SSRIs with the fluoxetine's half-life of seven days, um, you may need to wait, you know, quite a long time before you, you, you cross titrate to the citalopram. Okay, the fluoxetine, um, we have doses from 20 milligrams and you can give it up until 60 milligrams. I mean, some literature says 80 milligrams, um, but they had, I don't think that any significant uh, benefits that have been shown between 60 and 80 milligrams other than just um, side effects. So I wouldn't go above 60 milligrams of fluoxetine. Um, so we would start at 20 milligrams and the same approach as for citalopram. Um, assess response. Um, if partial response, you increase to a maximum of 60 milligrams. Um, and, you know, if, um, if the response is still not adequate, repeat the measures that you would have for the citalopram, um, reevaluate the diagnosis, general measures, um, adherence, and check for substance use. Delay dosage um, increase if there are any agitation or panicky feelings on any, on either one of the medications. Um, remember I said, you know, with patients that have depression, with anxious distress, those are the people that are at higher risk for suicide. Um, so if you rapidly increase the doses, despite the, the feelings of anxiety, um, that may be the outcome. Okay. If a sedating antidepressant is required, um, then you may need to consider an amitriptyline. <clears throat> However, I'm sure you're already aware of the challenges that we face with amitriptyline. It, it's got a lot of side effects. I mean, it blocks serotonin, no adrenaline, um, acetylcholine, um, it's got quite nasty side effects, um, especially with this, uh, you know, acetylcholine blockage, um, you know, dehydration, um, urinary retention, um, uh, hypotension. So this can cause quite a lot of issues, especially in the elderly. Um, if, you know, it is indicated in the patient where it is not contraindicated, then your maximum dose is 150 milligrams. Okay. Sleep hygiene is underrated. Um, it really is important um, before we start wanting to treat, you know, any sleep difficulties. Um, we spoke about the exercise and what we call an adequate cardiovascular exercise. Um, generally, we encourage people, you know, get home, relaxed, have a nice big meal, um, use the coming techniques, okay? And coming techniques um, aim at, you know, and, you know, any part of the senses um, that the patient may choose. So they may choose to, you know, take a nice long bath um, that will be coming to their skin and put like nice aromas in the bath. Um, they may want to read something that they find coming, um, you know, 
um, they should be encouraged to only use the bed for sleeping um, and, and not to hang out on the bed or to stay in the bed even when they feel that they can go to sleep. So not everyone sleeps, you know, the same amount of hours. Um, and sometimes people must accept that they sleep, you know, lesser hours than other people. And they should, they should, we should encourage them to get into a habit of regulating and not, you know, a, a routine and regular sleep cycle for them. Okay. So if they if if they opt to go to bed at 10 o'clock um, at night every day, then every day they need to make sure that at 10 o'clock they are in bed. If they struggle to fall in asleep in bed, they need to get out of the bed, um, do something, you know, con you know, may go back to the coming techniques, read something that is coming, write something, um, listen to coming music. What they absolutely need to avoid is a lot of mental stimulation, okay? So waking up, staying in bed, feeling frustrated, trying to, trying to force yourself to fall asleep, starting to look at phones, um, light is quite activating and we find that if you have been looking at the screen and the phones for too long even if you do fall asleep your quality of sleep is quite poor so avoid watching the tv especially watching the tv in bed waiting for sleep to come social media that can be quite stimulating and generally avoid noise they should limit the intake of caffeine um, alcohol and other drugs especially um, before bed Okay, I thought we should touch a little bit on managing the depression in the pregnancy, which I'm sure you have um, seen a lot of pregnant people with low moods. Um, and just a few pointers, SSRIs are associated with improved symptoms in the mother and better emotional and psychological development of the child. That's why we would want the mother to still continue with it. And the benefit is said to be greater with increasing illness severity. The effect of the SSRI in preg uh, on pregnancy, however, in anxiety is not clear. Um, with index presentations, as you would with any other person that's presenting with a depressive episode, you know, um, we try the non-pharmacological um, measures unless if the symptoms are, you know, severe enough. Um, and most importantly, because these medications bear side effects, it is important to make the patient psychoeducate the patient and, and to assist the patient to make their own decisions as to whether they want to take the medication or not okay so the risk benefit um, of the SSRIs must be must be um, discussed with the patient SSRIs generally I'm sure you would have seen in general practice generally they um, um, other than the cardiovascular side effects um, they they can cause some reflux um, they can worse than the reflex if it was already there. So generally are supposed to be used with caution in people with um, a peptic ulcers disease. In the, in the neonate or in the newborn, what we do see is um, a withdrawal from an SSRI, especially from a short acting SSRI, in that the withdrawal will present as you know, um, crying, the child is generally irritable, but that wins off very quickly um, within a matter of a couple of days after birth. Um, we may encourage the mother to continue breastfeeding um, because some of the, you know, this medication is passed through the breast milk and that would help with the withdrawal symptoms. Um, in the child itself, um, there may be bleeding issues. Um, uh, there may be excessive bleeding during labor. Those are the kind of symptoms that you're looking at. Um, avoid fluoxetine due to long half lives and relatively high concentration in breast milk. Um, Citalopram, um, I think is the mostly studied as well and has, has shown quite safer, um, to be quite safer in pregnancy and in breastfeeding. All antidepressants um, have the increased risk of miscarriage. Um, and transient neonatal symptoms and persistent pulmonary hypertension. I think uh, uh, benzodiazepines should be avoided. So sleep hygiene would be very important, especially in, in, a, in a nursing mother or in an expectant mother. There is some association with neurodevelopmental delays in the child. Um, and we worry mostly about the neonatal sedation and the respiratory depression. So just a word of caution, um, 
SSRIs may themselves cause agitation and increased risk of suicide in the first couple of weeks that you're treating the patient. Again, this, is, this bears the more significance in the person that already had some anxiety symptoms or, or anxious. So you need to monitor closely for clinical worsening, for suicidality or unusual changes in behavior. Families may be encouraged, you know, the mobilization of family support to also monitor the patient closely and report any um, concerns to the practitioner. The tricyclic antidepressants can be fatal in overdose and um, so try to avoid them in the elderly and patients with heart diseases, um, people with urinary retention, epilepsy and glaucoma. Please do avoid antidepressants in people with bipolar. Um, um, they can easily switch to manic. Um, and please do always keep your mind open for drug-drug interactions. Um, a lot of people tend to put themselves on also over-the-counter medications, such as St. John's Ward. Um, be aware of the possible drug-drug um, interactions of this. St. John's Ward, I think, also inhibits serotonin. So if, you, if someone came in on an over-the-counter, let's say, for example, St. John's Ward, and, and you gave him an SSRI, um, they may result in, in a serotonin syndrome, which we know causes hemodynamic instability, may cause seizures, and it's a medical emergency. Okay. So you're not expected to know how to treat bipolar and related disorders, but I thought, you know, we should at least talk about how they may present to you. So we've got two types of bipolar disorders, type 1 and type 2. Um, and according to the DSM-5 criterion, we look at it for at least four symptoms in each um, to make a diagnosis. I mean, sometimes you may only be able to detect, you may, may be detect less than four symptoms, but they're, they're severe and, and they warrant an admission. Okay. So we look for abnormally elevated, okay, elevated, very happy, excessively happy, or expansive mood or irritable mood with increased energy or what we call an increased in goal-directed activity. So this means that the person, the person becomes quite focused on doing one thing and may, may surmount a lot of resources to try and achieve that. Um, uh, an example may be someone that wants to give a message to the president um, and may, may, may fly from Cape Town to Johannesburg just to give the, the president this message as an increased goal-directed activity. Um, we look for inflated self-esteem, okay, um, um, in, inflated sense of um, importance, um, talkativeness, and more than talkativeness, we look for what we, you know, that they're pressured. So if someone is, is talkative enough to call pressured, it becomes quite difficult to interrupt them as they speak, and they do not allow you time to, to speak. You, it's difficult to converse with them um, because they're quite pressured and they have flight of ideas, okay. Um, we look for risky behaviors. This could be risky behaviors sexually. Um, this could be in their substance use, in their drug use. This could be um, in, in their spending of their finances, okay? Um, uh, spending money, giving money away. Um, we look for decreased need for sleep. The difference here between the sleep difficulties in bipolar and in depression is that with people that are depressed, they struggle to fall asleep or they struggle to maintain sleep. There's poor quality sleep. With people that have bipolar, they do not feel the need to sleep. Um, they don't want to sleep because they still feel that they have so much energy in the night. And in fact, they may, they may continue with, you know, with doing a lot of activities in the night and they do not tire. Unlike in depression where you know, their, their energy will be quite low, they're chronically fatigued. Here, the energy does not get depleted despite only sleeping for two, three hours at a time. Um, distractibility, you okay, not able to focus on one thing. Um, and, you know, they may also present with psychosis or they may just present with mania on its own. Okay, so that's bipolar one. Bipolar two is about the same criterion as bipolar one. The only difference is, is that now in bipolar two, we have what we call a hypomanic episode versus a manic episode in bipolar one. Hypomania is still the same symptoms, only um, 
that there is no significant change in functioning. So the person may still be able to continue um, with their work, you know, with whatever the day demands um, with these uncharacteristic changes um, in their functioning, okay? So the change in the functioning is not apparent. It may be noticed by people close to them, okay? So bipolar disorders, especially in the mania or, or hypomanic um, episode with or without psychosis. Hypomania, by the way, I forgot to mention, will not present with psychosis. Once there is psychosis, we are talking bipolar one. So they will require an urgent um, psychiatric referral. Um, what you could do acutely um, in your practices um, is to start some sedation. Um, depending on what you have, you have an option to either load them um, with sodium valproate like you would load someone that has epilepsy. Um, whether you, you want to load them IMI, IVI, or you give them an oral two gram um, of sodium valproate stat. Um, lorazepam or clonazepam um, are your options, um, depending on one, what you have. You give it IMI stat. You repeat every two to four hours, depending on how soon you can get the patient into a hospital facility. If patients are known, um, you do have an option to give them a haloperidol, which is an antipsychotic. And we say known because um, it is not safe to give someone that is not known, that may have not had haloperidol medication or any antipsychotic um, exposure in the past, because they may, you know, you may put them at risk to have a neuromalignant syndrome, NMS. So if someone is known, um, we know that they, they have had exposure to antipsychotic before, you know, the, the likelihood of NMS will be lower, of course, with the history that you would have. Um, so haloperidol with Phenagen, IMI stat, or if you have olanzapine 10 milligrams IMI stat, you may. Okay, so this, this will be the acute containment measures, right? When do you refer um, for, you know, the mood disorders that we have discussed, if there's inadequate response to treatment, um, if patients switch to either mania or hypomania, or there is a history of bipolar um, or, or bipolarity in the family. Um, if there is psychosis, okay, if you're worried about the suicide risk, okay, and I, I would urge you to also refer to people that are pregnant, um, okay, for management. We can always refer them back to you for continued management when stable. It is important, I feel, um, having worked at the PHCs um, in, in the mental clinics to differentiate between depression and grief and depression um, and what we call adjustment disorders, okay? Grief or bereavement, is, you know, happens after a loss and this is normal. This is what we expect for people um, to behave after they have lost an important loved one. So we find that patients present with intense sadness, um, they ruminate about the loss. So they talk about the loss a lot. They are preoccupied with thoughts um, of the loss. They, they would report feelings of emptiness and loss. Um, and this may occur in waves, okay? Um, and it gradually resolves. That's what's important, that grief is not permanent. Um, they are preoccupied with memories of the object lost or the person lost. Um, and this is, you know, when the memories come, this is associated with the pain, um, the comfort or some happiness, um, uh, you know, thinking about the person. There may be impairments in their neurovegetative functioning. So there's some impairments in sleep, um, some impairments in, in their levels of energy and in their appetite. And we can quite conservatively support them. Again, we could refer them to, uh, for self-help measures. We, we could ask a counselor to see them, to even maybe see them collectively as a family and offer them things like sleep hygiene again and reassure, I think is the most important, reassure that grief and bereavement is normal. It does not warrant treatment unless of course, you know, this, 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 um, symptoms worsen um, and you feel that they then qualify a major depressive episode like we've discussed, okay? And then we have what we call an adjustment disorder. With an adjustment disorder, there's an identifiable stressor. So there may have, there may have been a negative event that occurred. Um, that negative event does not necessarily need to be a death of a loved one. 
But from whatever negative life event that happened, there is emotional and behavioral symptoms um, after the, the occurrence of that stressor. Once, once the stressor and its consequences has terminated, the symptoms go away. So for example, um, you may see someone that, uh, that is undergoing divorce, for example, um, or just got divorced, um, you know, with maybe financial implications and other sorts of implications, and that they're, they're emotional and behave, you know, and, and then they have emotional and behavioral symptoms in keeping with the loss that they've just suffered. Um, only again, if this, this, the symptoms intensify and you, you feel that the severity qualifies a major depressive disorder, would we call a major depressive disorder and treat accordingly. Okay, I hope I'm making sense. All right, so uh, we are about an hour in. Um, I thought to put just one case discussion. Um, I'm not sure how many of us are in the discussion, but I'm hoping that we could all participate um, just to see if, um, you know, we, I have made enough emphasis on the important things. Um, so this is a case of a 30 year old female who presents to the clinic after a suicide attempt by means of an overdose. She took 30 paracetamol tablets. She's medically stabilized and referred to you for assessment. What information about the circumstances of the attempt would help you decide if the patient was genuinely suicidal? If anyone wants to offer an opinion, that would be nice. I think if you use the chat to just to respond. April? But I think I think okay. they they can use the chat. Unfortunately, it's a, a webinar, so they won't be able to unmute unless they pick okay. up their hand. But um, I think you've got the answers there, isn't? Um, no problem. Okay, I'm gonna do this to try and see the answers. I think you had them on the slide. Is it? Okay, I think I see more of a question um, and that we will answer later. Maybe I should just go through this. I think just go through it. Time won't allow too much of discussion. I see one or two responses. Um, uh, you can see the chat function. There's some responses. Um, Zine says circumstances surrounding the attempt. Victoria says you need to assess the suicide attempt. Uh, was it active or not? And Michelle says, what was the intent? Um, similar means of attempt. So you know, how serious is the suicide attempt? But I think you're talking about uh, assessing her depression, whether she has made a depression or not. And in the circumstance of her being pregnant. Mm -hmm. So, so I think I think some of the answers are quite correct. You know, it, this is about a suicidal assessment. Um, so it's quite correct because you, you know you need to make a decision as to you know is, is this patient going to be admitted? Is she not going to be admitted? Um, what risk um, you know is she to herself and to other people? So quite correct. Um, some of the answers. Um, I mean, you look at you consider things like um, you know, is she single? Um, you know, we we know that divorced or single people are said to be at the highest risk for suicide. Um, we look at um, the sex. We know that the male gender um, is at highest risk for suicide. Again, the female gender um, 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 has a lot of su suicidal attempts, um, but you know, less often successful than with the male gender. Um, so male gender, higher success rate of completed suicides. Um, the age, um, we look at the age, you know, the two young people or two old people, maybe not too old, but at least above the age of 45. Um, we know that the risk increases. Um, we look at the diagnosis that people may have, okay? We look at psychiatric diagnosis, especially diagnosis that make people feel quite hopeless and worthless, such as depression. Um, we know that that puts them at a much higher risk um, than other people. We look at medical diagnosis, especially, especially you know, significant chronic 
medical diagnosis and um, that may be you know quite a burden to the person and um, whether it's the, you know the actual diagnosis is a burden or the taking of the medication is the burden or um, the complications that come with the diagnosis puts people at higher risk okay especially people that have chronic pain disorders okay and we know those are at much higher risk for for suicides Okay, and then we look at previous suicidal behaviors. Um, you know, typically, what has the person presented with um, before? You know, is this the first time? Have they have they presented with something similar? We can only measure risk based on what the information we have from the past. Okay, and and even even with that, we only try to measure it. It can never be an accurate um, assessment that we do. And then we look at the use of especially alcohol and substances. We know that that is associated with higher risks of completed suicide or suicide attempt. A lot of people um, gain the courage to commit suicide once they have pinched on, on alcohol or other substances. And then we look at relationships. I mean, if people have closer um, relationships or they've got emotional support, um, that protects them against the risk and um, 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 and people without emotional and social support are at much higher risk. And maybe that is why single people are, are, are seem to have to be at a much higher risk. And then we, we look at generally coping skills. Okay, what coping skills does the person have on board? What do they usually do? Do they have hobbies? Do they have things that they do? How do they usually deal with difficulties? Um, and we look at their rational thinking. If you think they have lost rationality in the thinking, then their risk is high for suicide. If you, if you find that they can still rationalize, you know, I, I wish to die, but I will not do it because of these reasons, then, then um, that softens the risk. Um, and most importantly, we, we look at how organized they are in terms of wanting to kill themselves. Okay, do they have an intent to, to you know, do they have a clear plan um, um, and intent to die. So if, if someone is telling you, I'm gonna take the gun and I'm gonna shoot myself, then the risk is obviously very high, okay? Um, the patient gives a history of feeling sad for the last three weeks. Um, she's struggling to sleep at night, has very low appetite and energy, is unable to concentrate at college. She says that this symptom started after she found out she was pregnant. How is your approach to manage, um, to the management of this patient? Okay, I think the patient clearly seems to have significant symptoms of depression, so you would want to treat her for depression. Um, so when we when we deal with um, pregnant mothers, as, as we have just said, um, um, and with the with the objectives of the primary health care it is about the screening and the early detection and the early treatment and um, preventing neonatal and maternal mortalities and negative outcomes, we know that we want we want a healthy mother who can bond with her child who, you know, we want a healthy pregnancy to encourage bonding. And once that baby is born, we want to encourage what we call attachment, which is the baby attaching to the mother, the baby forming a connection to the mother. For the mother to be able to form a, con a connection with baby and baby to be able to form a connection with mother in return, mother needs to be very healthy. If you have a very sad mother, um, who is attempting suicide, who's in and out of hospital, um, that, that connection is going to be interrupted. Hence, we find that um, there are a lot of, a lot of negative um, outcomes that are associated with you know, depression in pregnancy, premature um, labor, um, neonatal mortality, uh, um, neonates born with low weights, with a lot of neonatal complications, and then just generally poor attachment, the mother not being able to breastfeed, the mother not being interested in the child. And we've seen the rates of neonanticide um, in our country, mother killing herself, killing um, the children, um, or just killing the child or giving the child away, abandoning children in the streets, okay? So we weigh the pros and the cons before we, we, we start any um, pharmacology with the patient. And again, like I said, the patient needs to be well informed of the complications um, that we discussed that, that come from the SSRIs. And we clearly need to document um, you know, um, this information that we give them about the pros and the cons. A healthy mother would be able to bond, the baby would be able to attach to mother, they would be able to produce breast milk, encourage bonding and have a normal you know, um, maternal, um, and um, connection between mom and child, okay? So you choose to treat her with citalopram. What dose would you commence with and what information will you give her 
regarding the use of their antidepressants. Okay, and I think that talks to one of the slides that we had, um, that we would start at 10 milligrams um, for a week and increase it thereafter. Uh, I think, Prof, I think my time is done. Um, I saw a question. Thank you that very much. Yeah. We, also, a question that I wanted to answer um, that has been here for some time um, from an anonymous attendee. It's, I've had some male patients who have yes. been. If you can just answer that. When SSRI is complaining of erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation, this causes them a lot of distress and often causes them to stop taking their treatment. Is there any way to prevent or treat this? Or could you change their medication to a different drug? And if so, which drugs would be preferred to treat depression but avoid the side effect? Okay, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, looking at the depression illness, um, it is associated um, with ejaculation um, sexual dysfunction. Okay, It is associated with sexual dysfunction itself without the medication. So sometimes it is important to ascertain that you know, the, the symptoms were only brought on by the medication and that it is not a result of the illness, okay? So I know it becomes quite a bit of an other look, but sometimes when you give medication and we treat the depression, we find that the sexual dysfunction improves. Where you can clearly map that, the, you know, before you started an SSRI, the patient did not have the sexual dysfunction, um, then you have an option to either reduce your SSRI, reducing it, obviously keeping in mind that you had to go up with the SSRI because your treat, your patient was not responding well. So they may you know, have a re-emergence of the depressive symptoms, but that's one of your options, reduce it or change to another SSRI, okay? If both of the SSRIs do the same thing, you have an option to change to an SNRI, which we said we have a venlafaxine available. Um, and that, that may improve the symptoms. Um, if you still find that even on the SNRI, you still have problems if um, um, amitriptyline is not contraindicated, you may consider that. But if, you, if that's still an issue, then you may want to refer the patient to us then or call us for an opinion. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, no, thank you very much. I think that um, there are no other questions. Give me a second. Um, there are no other questions. Perhaps we can um, close. Are there any other questions? I think there's a, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Litlotlo. Really appreciate you taking the time out. I think uh, just for everyone's uh, information, uh, there'll be a second session, I think in two weeks time, uh, where Dr. Litlotlo will go through psychosis. Am I correct, Dr. Litlotlo? Yes, that is correct. All right. So keep an eye out for that and join us next week. Um, there's also a, a weekly um, a, a CPD meeting, but Dr. Letlotl will be back in two weeks' time. Thank you all. Keep well, be safe. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Thank Dr. Letlotl. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Pitkov, any comments? No, Prof. I'm fine. Thank you for all having right. me. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. No, there is no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. There is uh, interesting um, links that were sent on the chat box. If we could yes. get that links distributed to... Yeah, our... I'll, I'll pick that up. And then Dr. Litlotlo, if you don't mind sending me your slides, we'll just circulate it. Put we'll it on do the that. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. The recording will be on the website. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.